Eternal God, your kingdom is broken into our troubled world through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. Help us to hear your word and obey it, so that we become instruments of your redeeming love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. first lesson today comes from Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 7 through 20 which can be found in your pew Bible on page 856 856 <clears throat> so you son of man I have made a watchman of the house of Israel whenever you hear a word from my mouth you shall give them a warning from me if I say wicked O wicked one you shall surely die and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declare the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but in the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from the evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your people, the righteous of the excuse me, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him when he transgresses. But as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall, but by when he turns from his wickedness. And the righteous shall not be able to live by his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in the righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statue of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the sins that he commits shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right. He shall surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just. When it is their own way, that is not just. When the righteous turns from the righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just, O house of Israel. I will judge each of you according to his ways. The second reading comes from, the first, comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. And it can be found in your pew Bible on page 1137. 1137. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place, for example, for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to drink, to eat, and rise up and play. We must not indulge in sexual immortality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. 
we must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, that they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the age has come. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Here in the reading. Good morning. I need for all of the children to come up to the children's bed. Oh, I love you. I love you. Hmm, we're going to see. Let's see what a good listener you are, okay? I need you to sit around in front of me so I can see your eyes. Can you turn around? There we go. Perfect, perfect. David, here where I can see you nice and close so you can hear me. Miss Leslie still has that allergy stuff going on. How are y'all this morning? Good. Very good. You know what? Today we're going to talk about bearing fruit. And if you listen really closely to the pastor, he mentioned something about fruit. So today we're going to talk about fruit in the Bible. Jesus tells us specifically, he said, he wants us to bear fruit. Now, I want you to take a look at this tree. I, I, didn't, I couldn't bring a big fruit tree into the, the church, although I did try to get Mr. Henry to do it. He wouldn't do it for me. So I had to bring a black and white picture instead. I'm sorry. Do you see this picture? Is it bearing any fruit? It doesn't look like it's bearing any fruit, does it, right there? Yeah. What happens? What do we have to do to make a fruit tree really grow? Yes, yes. Water, good. We have to put water on it, and when it rains, it, it, it grows up into a little fruit tree. Definitely. Water is very important. Fig trees like water. What else? What were you going to say? And, and when it rains again, it gets bigger. That's exactly yes. right, Grace. Say again. Yes. <gasps> Absolutely. You have to put dirt. And what else? One more little thing. Water. Water. Well, it certainly has to be a fruit tree. You're right for it to be a fruit. It, it's yeah. it's You're exactly right. It, what about a little fertilizer? If it, if it, if it, if it, if it rains very long, it goes into bigger tree. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to talk about is water. I need for you to listen to me. Can you listen to me? The tree needs to be a fruit tree. Yeah. yeah, it does. That's important. Then it needs, what's that big yellow thing that glows up in the, the, sun. the sun? Very good. And some water yeah. and maybe some fertilizer. Well, in the Bible, Jesus tells a story or a parable. Do you know what a parable is? Yeah, I know. You do? You do know? A parable is a lesson or a story that Jesus uses all the time throughout the Bible. Because you know what? Because we're human and he knows that we need the lesson really simple so that we can understand it. So, so Jesus would use a parable to help explain really important things that he wanted us to remember. Now, he starts, you know, there are great stories in the Bible. Are you ready for this one? This is a good one. Jesus tells this story, and there's this gardener, and he has a fruit tree, and he didn't grow for three years. Now, what would happen if you didn't grow for three years? Uh, my, my fruit tree grows for this many years. Really? It does take that many. It takes a lot of years. Well, yeah. three years. So the gardener comes through, and you know what he says? Cut it down. Cut it down. It's not bearing any fruit. Let's just cut it down. Mm. Now, why do you think the gardener would say that? Oh, well, I, I didn't cut growing. Because it wasn't growing. And when you cut down that tree, what does it do for the other trees? Go ahead. Kind of helps them down. Yeah, it makes a little room for them. But you know what? The man that was working in the orchard, you know what he, what he said? Or in the grove. You know what he said? He said, you know what? Let me 
fertilize it. Let me dig around it, put some fresh soil. And you know what? Let's give it one more year. He wanted to give it a second chance. And if it does not bear fruit, then I will cut it down. So, you know what? Like that fruit tree, Jesus says he wants us to grow fruit. And fruit for luck for us is like characteristics, you know, quality that where we show that we are followers well, of Jesus, like you, kindness. If you, and hear, love. if you eat a whole lot of candy and make you sick and you didn't eat fruit. That's a very good point, David. You're absolutely right. If we eat too much candy, it will make us sick. But you know what? If you eat too much fruit, it, make you sick too. It, it could if you eat too much of anything's not good. It's not good. That's why my or, my tummy uh, looks the way it is because or, I eat or, too much. Or if you eat, if, or if you eat junk stuff. Or if you you're absolutely right. But like a tree to bear fruit, we have to be Jesus followers. So Jesus tells us to turn away and not make bad choices. You ever made a bad choice? I have to. I, I have. We have to believe in Jesus. Then like a then like a tree has the right water, has what else? The right sun, and a little bit of fertilizer. Very good. Then we too can bear fruit. You know, I didn't have any figs on my small tree. I have a small fig tree in my yard. It's not bearing fruit yet. It's, it's still too young. Well, you That's exactly light. what this is. This is a fig tree. And I brought another boring picture. It is a small fig. But you know what? Because my fig tree wasn't bearing any figs, it wasn't bearing any fruit right now, I brought you the next best thing to help you remember this parable about the fig tree. Okay. It's called a fig newton. <laughs> Do any of you know what a fig newton is? It's a cookie that wraps up this delicious fruit, gooey stuff in the middle. And it's fig fruit. Right? But I did write the Bible verse, Luke 13, 1 through 9, so you and your parents can read it again when you go home. But before you get your fig newton, I, let's pray. There you From St. Luke, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse 1. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Now there were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
And Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And the vine dresser answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Okay, saints, um, uh, some heavy readings today, right? Uh, pretty weighty stuff. Um, and I think for me, when I was reading this gospel lesson, it, uh, it immediately raised a very pertinent and urgent question that is asked all the time and booted around on the internet all the time, which is this, why do bad things happen to good people? Why did those church folks who were praying in the temple um, get killed that day when Pilate mingled all their blood in their sacrifices? Or why did those day workers who were working on that tower and it fell down and killed them all, why did they die such an untimely death in such a horrific manner? And you could multiply the situations. Why are the elderly and infants being bombed to death in Ukraine? Why did my best friend's mother just die in an automobile accident? Why did I have to bury a four-year-old who drowned in a pool? Right? Why do those kinds of bad things happen to seemingly good and innocent people? Now, <clears throat> there's one obvious answer to this which we currently see in the war. Bad things happen to good people because bad people do bad things, right? Um, Putin's war on Ukraine and the bombing of civilian centers is bringing death and injury to many innocent civilians who've done absolutely nothing to Putin or Mother Russia. So why do bad things happen to good people? Sometimes it's because of human evil. And you know, if you really thought this through real long and hard, you would recognize that much of what bad is happening in the world happens because of human evil. But we're going to set that aside, and because there's two other answers that are given to this question historically. Many, uh, many years ago, uh, in centuries past, the answer to the question would have simply been this. Bad things happen to good people because those good people aren't really good. They deserved it. Okay? Read the book of Job. Job's three friends sit there over 30-some chapters trying to convince him that all the bad things that happened to him happened because there must be something wrong with you, Job. Just confess it to God. Stop lying. You know? Tell God what it is, and then he'll forgive you. Of course, Job is going, what? I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. So that's one of those answers. Um, there's a variation on this, a variation on this, and um, people are getting what they deserve because of sins in their past life or sins earlier on in their life. We popularly kind of call this the law of karma, which comes uh, out of Hinduism, right? So why do bad things happen to good people? Well, a very ancient answer was because the people deserve it. Now, I suspect that you and I, as we're sitting here, that doesn't go over very well with us, does it? I suspect that we don't like that answer very much. And I mean, Putin may deserve his comeuppance or Hitler, but a four-year-old drowning in a pool? What, what, what? Okay, here's another answer often given, and it's probably the most popular one in the modern age. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's God's fault! Right? That's the modern age. 
Either it's his fault because he's mean and vindictive and a hateful, loathsome kind of being who would do such a thing to the punish, you know, who would punish the innocent just because that's how God is. Or maybe it's God's fault because he's too weak to do anything about it. He can't protect them. Or in the rise of atheism, there is no God to stop any of this stuff. So it's still God's fault even though he doesn't exist. <laughs> right? You, you, you see that train of thought? God's a bad God, God's a weak God, or there is no God to stop such things. And I really believe that most of us are parked here. When we see and read and hear about these terrible things that happen to innocent people, we don't tend to blame ourselves, and we don't tend to blame them. We tend to blame the big fella above. Our modern hearts don't really ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people so much as we throw it in God's face, in our own holy indignation. Yeah, God, why do you allow those bad things to happen? So, here you have this conundrum, blame the sinner or blame God. Or you can blame the evil people, but we're putting that aside. Blame the sinner or blame God. Which one is it that you do? So let's ask the question, now what about Jesus? Because he kind of talks about this in the lesson, doesn't he? Now let's remember as we start here who he is. He is the Son of God. And there's this happy marriage between heaven and earth in his person. Son of God, fully God, but also incarnate of the Virgin Mary, fully man. So you have this person, Jesus, who sees things from above and sees things from below perfectly on both levels. So then, does Jesus blame the sinner? Verse 2, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Well, kind of sounds like he's not blaming the sinner there, is he? No, but I tell you, unless you repent, you also will perish. Uh-oh, kind of sounds like he's blaming sin and sinners, isn't he? Does Jesus blame the sinner? Well, the answer seems to be no and yes. No, bad things that happen to good people doesn't mean that they are being punished for secret sins. Jesus doesn't go there. That's not how the punishment of God, uh, God's punishment against sin works. If it did, every time you and I sin, there'd be a lightning bolt striking us dead. But that's not how it works, is it? But yes, Jesus reminds all of us that we are all sinners in need of repentance. And Jesus isn't interested in ranking little sins that, eh, okay, God could probably let those go. And big sins, well, those God definitely needs to punish, right? Jesus isn't interested in tracing out how God punishes every sin with this or that consequence, but rather Jesus is interested that all of us should be concerned about our own lives, that we are right with God before we perish under God's eternal punishment and condemnation of sin. Now remember, this is the guy who sees things clearly from above, so apparently he understands God's wrath very well, God's punishment of sin but also sees things from below. So apparently God doesn't play these games of, oh, I can point my finger at you and I know why you got what you got because I know what you did, right? It, Jesus doesn't play that game. The Son of God understands that in God's realm there is no room for sin. Sin, after all, is rebellion against the God of all light and all goodness, and one can't stand in the presence of a holy God as a bare-naked, rebellious sinner. God condemns sin and puts it away. So why do bad things happen to good people? Well, Jesus doesn't single out any particular 
sinner and try to trace out any particular sin, but he does warn all of us that the judgment of God against sin is real, and we better take it seriously. As we heard in uh, Ezekiel, right, even though that was hard to follow, whew, yes, that's what he was saying, as we heard in Paul there in Corinthians. You better take the judgment of God seriously. Well then, is Jesus then blaming God? Because he's also fully human, and we humans like to do that. Is Jesus blaming God? Well, here's the interesting thing. Jesus follows up this warning about judgment against sin with this little parable. And as is usually the case in the parables of Jesus, this is meant to shed light on God's character as it is being seen, worked out, or made real in Jesus' ministry. So, let's just look at the parable. So a man, let's call him God in the parable, planted a fig tree, that would be you and me, right? In his vineyard, that would be the world. And he expected the fig tree to bear fruit. We'll get to fruit in a little bit. And it didn't bear fruit, so he says, cut it down. All right. God has expectations. If you're not meeting them, if you're not obedient, if you're not living in His way and will, there then is a cut it down moment coming. And then He tells the man who tends the vineyard, and let's say that's Jesus, to cut it down. But that man, Jesus, says, oh no, not yet. Let's give it one more year. I'll fertilize it good, and then let's see if it will bear fruit. So what is Jesus telling us here with this parable? Well, rather than doing bad things to innocent people, the truth of the matter is God is actually patient and merciful to sinners, especially in sending them His Son to help them bear fruit. And that's not an act of an evil and vindictive God. That kind of God wouldn't send someone to help sinners. But that's the act of a God of love and mercy. That's what love and mercy would do, send a Savior, right? And to get a sense of just how merciful God is in this parable, here's how long God's mercy has really been patient with us, according to the parable. A little bit of horticulture from the Middle East. When you planted that fig tree, you gave it three years to grow to fruit-bearing stage. Three years. Then, you probably don't realize this, but the law of Moses in Leviticus says the next three years you were forbidden to eat the fruit. It was given to God, so to speak. Let it do its thing. And maybe it was allowed for the poor to eat it, but you weren't forbidden, you were forbidden to go harvest that fruit. So now you've got three plus three, that's six years. Then the person who owned the fig tree would come in the seventh year and pick fruit, but there's no fruit there. Then he would come in the eighth year and pick fruit, but there's no fruit there. Then he would come in the ninth year, there's no fruit there. In other words, after three years of looking for fruit, there's nothing. Now you got three plus three plus three equals nine years of patience. That's a lot wider than it looked at the beginning, didn't it? What a patient God. And then when it's time to cut it down, it's extended another year. And not only that, now there's a Savior. Oh, no, 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 don't cut it down. I'm going to go get some manure and we'll make this thing work. So isn't that a beautiful, beautiful picture of the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God in that little parable towards sinners? toward you and me. God is mercifully patient with sinners. And the gospel says that Jesus Christ has come to help us bear fruit that we need never be cut down in the day of judgment. So, the question for this third week in Lent is, am I bearing fruit for God well, maybe the best way to answer that question is not to 
just immediately look at yourself and start trying to count your good works versus your bad works. Did I, did I, are my good works better than my bad works? Which ones? Okay, where do I? Maybe that's not the place to start. Maybe the place to start is to look at that gardener who's fertilizing your life with his life, Jesus. Over in John 15, Jesus uses a very similar horticultural picture to talk about this. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. You know... When you look at it that way and ask the question, am I bearing fruit? The first fruit of righteousness, that is, of being reconciled to God, is the fruit of faith. That is the first fruit. Here in Lent, it's good to ask yourself if your faith is real and true. Are you abiding in Jesus? Putin says he's abiding in Jesus. He made all kinds of Christian uh, in, uh, inferences about why he was doing what he was doing in Ukraine. Crazy. Is that really abiding in Jesus? Are you really abiding in Jesus as he truly is and living in the way he truly calls you to live? Is your faith being fertilized by the Lord? Now, unfortunately, right now I'm preaching to the choir because all of you are here. Right? I mean, you can ask these kinds of questions. Uh, how's my prayer life? Have I been talking to God lately? And if the answer is no, then you would go, hmm. Have you been reading your Bible trying to increase your knowledge and understanding of God's will? And if the answer is no, hmm. Have you gotten out of the good habit of assembling with the saints of God and not going to church because, you know, COVID made that possible? Hmm. Have you not had the Holy Sacrament in a month of Sundays? Oh, once a year at Easter isn't enough, my friends. Hmm. See, have you ignored the needs of others, especially the poor? Jesus says in Matthew 25, find me in the poor. Hmm. Have you decided that your life is your own to do with whatever you please, rather than that you're simply a steward and a servant of God? Hmm. Are you abiding in Jesus? You have to ask these questions and take measure of yourself, and that's part of what Lent is for. Now, if you are abiding in Jesus then that means the first fruit of righteousness is on your tree, and that is the fruit of faith. A living faith in the Savior with a deep commitment to God and a love for the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom that you want to share with the world. So why do bad things happen to good people? The man from heaven reminds us that the judgment of God is real. We need to hear that clearly. But he is also the man of earth who reminds us that God's mercy is patiently waiting for sinners to return to him, to serve him, to live for him. God always receives the one who repents. So judgment or mercy. Sinful pride shakes its fist in the face of God for such a choice. Fruitful faith blesses God that there is such a choice. Amen. Heavenly Father, Grant us that fruit of faith, O Lord, that keeps us always abiding in Jesus, 
and then use us, O oh Lord, to bear other fruits in our lives. We pray it in his holy name. Amen. Now, if you'll please stand and let's sing the hymn of the day. <laughs> We've had a lot of prayer requests come in this week. Let me share them with you. Uh, we've been asked to pray for our brother Ernest Zipperer, who's been experiencing some heart issues, but doing okay right now. Um, we've been asked to pray for uh, Baylor Zipperer. Rejoice in his uh, birth here to Devin and Rebecca, and uh, that they be blessed with this new addition. Um, and we've also been asked to pray for uh, Ella Hart Musso Sanderlin, uh, Betty and uh, Nick's granddaughter uh, now, again, a joyful addition, and for parents Sean and Jane Sanderlin. Um, we've been asked to pray for, uh, uh, it's Ilya, Eli, Elia, Elia, I think is how they pronounce it. Elia is actually is a little bit premature, so she's going to spend a couple of weeks in the NICU, so we want to continue to pray for her. Uh, we've been asked to pray for um, friends of the Williams, Caitlin Reichert, I believe that's a goddaughter, and um, is the uh, husband Brendan? Okay, and they have a high-risk pregnancy going on, so we want to pray for them as they go through this. Um, I received a call and uh, went to visit a woman on her deathbed. Her name is Elizabeth Papagno, uh, who's dying down at Candler, and there's no turning it around, unfortunately, unless God does a miracle. So I've been asked to pray for her and her family. She has two boys. Um, so... We've also been asked to pray for the family of Julie Sykes, who was killed in a car accident uh, this past week, and I believe this were friends of the Waldowers. So a lot of prayer requests. Uh, let's take them first to the Lord. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, you have heard our request. You know each and every one of these people. You know the joy that there is that, that comes from uh, children received as they are born into the world, O oh Lord. We pray that that joy would be magnified in those families, O oh Lord, the Zipper and Sanderlin families. And we pray that you would especially be with Elia, that um, you would help her to grow and reach her uh, good birth weight now in these couple of weeks in NICU. Watch over her, Lord, and watch over the parents as they, as they anchor anxiously await her uh, uh, ability to come home. We also want to pray, O oh Lord, for those who are 
suffering the loss of loved ones or who are anticipating the loss of loved ones. The sting of death is so, so hard, Lord, on us. We just pray for your comfort and mercy and the movement of your Holy Spirit in the lives of these families and these people um, as they suffer now, O oh Lord, at this time. Strengthen them to have faith in you, O oh Lord. Surround them with loving people who will walk with them in their journey of grief, O oh Lord, and bring them, O oh Lord, to that place where they can commend their lost loved ones to you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All right. What shall we pray for? Any prayers over here? Yeah. Inquire. Co-worker Dwayne, who was found out he has prostate cancer. Okay. Okay. Do you want to pray for him, sure. Richard? Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for uh, the beautiful weather and the time you give us here on earth. Uh, Lord, I ask a special prayer this morning for my coworker Dwayne, who has gotten some news back that's uh, not what he really wanted to hear. And as he uh, embarks on treatment for his prostate cancer, um, just be with him, his family, and guide them through the every step that you would have them go. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Any prayers from this section over here? Any prayers over here in this section? Any prayers from this section? Yes, Phyllis. Thank you for reminding us of uh, the people we don't see because they're not here, but their hearts need fellowship as well. So wonderful. Do you want me to pray for, for that? Okay, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do remember all of those who would love to be in your house of worship but can't, often because of advanced age, O oh Lord, but sometimes sickness or what have you. We pray that they would find um, a way to be fed, that their faith might be fed, O oh Lord. Send them, again, people who will care for them, listen to them, call them on the phone, visit them, send them devotional materials. Give them what they need, O oh Lord, to know that they they are also loved and not forgotten by your church, but still a part of your church, even though they can't come to church. And we thank you, Lord, for all of those caregivers who do watch over our loved ones who are in nursing homes and, and retirement homes and or who are watching over people at home who are sick or aged. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Any prayers over in this section? Well, let's, oh, um. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Brenda, Brenda is now at Lakeview. And uh, it's gotten harder and harder for her to walk. There is some concern, and she's being tested for Parkinson's disease right now. So, um, and I've been with her and taken her communion, and uh, unless something's happened in the last couple of days that I don't know of, that's pretty much what's going on. So let's pray for our, our sister Brenda. Heavenly Father, we do. Uh, bring before you our sister Brenda, who till recently was with us and among us, but now it's getting harder to do so. Again, we pray that you would be with her. Let the testing that is being done, Lord, uh, bring results that hopefully mean there are treatments that can be given. And in this difficult time of her life, Lord, we pray that you would... Grant your healing power in her body, O oh Lord, and that you would sustain her in every way um, now as she uh, lives over at Lakeview. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Let us pray for the war victims. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who are victims of this terrible war and of all the places where there is uh, violence among people, groups, and nations around the world. We pray that this violence, Lord, would come to an end soon. We don't 
presume to know all of the reasons why it is allowed or Lord. Other than that, you rule over the nations and know what you are doing for even better things down the road. But we do pray that this war would stop and that the time of healing would begin. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for this congregation and all your holy congregations around the world, that we might be about the work of Jesus, that we might truly and indeed be people of strong faith, fertilized by his word and sacraments, O Lord, help us to carry out our mission of caring for others and preaching the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for our call committee as they continue to interview candidates. And again, we pray that you would bring us that candidate who can serve here as a blessing to us and that we might be a blessing to them. Lord, in your mercy. All right, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord has set the godly apart for himself. The Lord hears when they call to him. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, draw our hearts to you. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, St. Paul exhorts us with these words concerning the Holy Sacrament. Let a person examine themselves and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup in order that we may worthily partake of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness he offers, let us examine our hearts and confess our sins to our merciful God. O oh God, I confess that I have sinned against you and others by my own fault. With the humble and contrite heart, I live to you the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed, asking your mercy and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Amen. Come now in faith to the holy table that you may commune with Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Now the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and for our good benefit that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal and faith in life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Take and eat the body of Christ for you. The body of Christ for you. This is Christ's body, given into death for you. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ.
blood of our Lord preserve you in the true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence strengthen you for spiritual battle through the spirit of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 